Uh, Professor Chidambaram, it's a delight to, to be speaking to you this evening. So we're going to be discussing some topics around materials for energy. But I just wanted to start, you know, you've done some really interesting roles beyond what a normal academic would do. So you've been principal science advisor to the government of India, India chairman of the science advisory committee. So how did your career develop to give you those opportunities? See, the scientific business of the government of India is divided into many scientific departments. There is a department for atomic energy, the department for space, the department of science and technology, department of uh, biotechnology and so on. But there are things uh, which do not fall into any one of these specific territories. Attracting young people to careers in science. How do you identify and nurture uh, gifted children? Or there are things in which uh, which are of interest to many departments for setting up the National Knowledge Network, which is a high-speed optical fiber network connecting all the knowledge institutions in the country. Or for the matter, how do you deliver knowledge to rural India? We have a program on Rural Technology Action Group, which is centered in seven of our Indian institutes of technology. Or we are able to bring together, do an advanced ultrasopocritical thermal plant, we can build together the best materials people, Indira Gandhi Center for Atomic Research, best equipment makers like Bharat Heavy Electricals Limited, and the best utility in India, which is the Nuclear Thermal Power Corporation. So essentially, those are the kind of things uh, which, which we try to, uh, try to support. But how did your personal career develop that you took these roles? See, I started uh, as a basic research scientist mm -hmm. because my PhD was in nuclear magnetic resonance. Though I did dabble around a little bit in analog computers. Then I went to neutron scattering because at that time I was very much interested in hydrogen bonds, hydrogen bonds in hydrates and hydrogen bonds in biological, uh, biological molecules and neutrons are of course a much better method of locating uh, hydrogens directly which X-rays find it very difficult to do. And neutrons, the uh, NMR is a slightly indirect, uh, indirect method. Then I switched to high pressure physics. And high pressure physics is a very That's fascinating. That's a big change. <laughs> That's a big change. And uh, of course, I got interested in shockwave physics for various reasons. And you can change the, uh, see you, if, you, if you heat a material before it melts, maybe 20% is volume can change. But if you squeeze a material, you can change interatomic distances very, very substantially. And that gives you much better methods apart from its applications. It also gives a uh, good idea about uh, theories which talk about from first principles, electron density functional theories and things like that. Okay, so we're going to then uh, ask you a few questions relating to materials for energy. So, uh, what environmental effect do you see as the most difficult to manage when developing new materials for renewable, sustainable energy? See, you, you have to look at it, it's in only in the production process. In the process of uh, uh, creating the energy, uh, of course, uh, one can make sure that you can minimize the experimental effects. But in the case of uh, producing those materials, then you must adopt the principles of green chemistry so that use uh, chemicals which are not toxic or don't create waste which are toxic. So essentially those are the things which uh, practically everybody takes care of, disposing of whatever the kind of uh, sources or method is of producing energy. Okay, so we, we hear a lot about electrical cars, don't we? And indeed, you know, it's much easier now to find places to plug in, you know, to recharge your car. Um, what do you think the most important challenges are to develop electrical cars so that really they become used on a, on a I large think it basis? Is, uh, it is very important from whether it's a moped or an electric car or, for example, even a, in a vehicle. And to my mind, hybrids to start with will be a, have a much greater significance. When you're driving in traffic, uh, stop and when you want to start the car, use electric. When you're driving long distances, you go, uh, go fossil, hybrid cars. Because it does take energy to produce uh, the materials which go into an electric car. 
So, but of course, from an environmental point of view, electric cars or hybrid cars, they are going to be, already they are very, very important. So, how long is it going to be before most of us are driving a hybrid car? <laughs> Hybrids are already there, hybrids. Yeah, but still not many people, you know, it's a not, small proportion of yes, people own these. See, when I, you have to be environmentally conscious. At the and moment, rich. I think, yeah. uh, the electric cars are a little more costlier than uh, mm -hmm. uh, fossil, uh, fossil fuel uh, cars. But I think this will come, but you will have to look at the entire life cycle of the production of the vehicle. At the place where it is used, of course, it doesn't produce. A, pollution. Mm -hmm. But what kind of energy have you used to produce all the materials which have gone into the electric car? One so is this more substantial that. than preparing a, a fossil fuel car? I, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult, it has to be looked at carefully. Ca carefully. Surely we have an uh, electric mobility mission in India mm -hmm. like in many other countries to trying to introduce, particularly in uh, specific areas, In my, that's my personal opinion specific areas where there are valuable monuments, where there are tourist spots mm -hmm. and things of that kind. It will be easier to introduce these cars and maintain these cars. Like you mentioned, setting up this uh, el these electrical um, output uh, points at, across the country is a very, but limited specific area, it will become uh, logistically more easy, maybe economically more easy to set up those points. And do you think it would make a substantial difference to the climate if indeed everybody stuck to a, a hybrid car rather than the fossil fuel? Is it worth maybe governments actually subsidising this? Government may have to subsidise, but quite apart, uh, quite apart from this, hybrid is my feeling will come first. But there, of course, you must have energy storage systems mm -hmm. which have to be simultaneously uh, developed. Any time you use energy and you want to release it slowly, then you have to have energy, either batteries or ultra capacitors and all that. And there are programs, people are interested in lithium ion batteries and beyond that, how to increase the uh, energy capacity and bring down the cost of uh, these batteries are used from mobiles to Dreamliner, the, um, the battery storage system, renewable energy they are used. Certainly, and, and here one, one, must, uh, one must think of those. Batteries are an essential part of, uh, I think, electric vehicles. Okay, thank you. So, probably a topic close to your heart. We're now going to discuss Sorry? nuclear energy. Nuclear. Right. <clears throat> so, I'm kind of interested in what your opinion is on the future of nuclear energy. So, the UK, we have just bought into an extremely expensive deal with the French and the Chinese you know, to build Hinkley Point, a new nuclear centre. But if you look at, for example, Germany and Switzerland, they are going to remove all nuclear energy you know, in the next what, few decades. So what is your opinion? What is the future of nuclear? See, Do you think governments are correct to be uh, going away from nuclear? See, you have to look at each country differently. See, the, uh, I have written that the Human Development Index to the United Nations defines in terms of three parameters, per capita GDP, life expectancy at birth, and adult literacy. I have been saying for 20 years and more that you can redefine it in terms of just two parameters, per capita electricity consumption and female literacy. I will not go into the literacy part of it. That's, uh, separate and interesting, uh, interesting issue. And developing countries like India have to increase their per capita electricity consumption very substantially. Even if you don't want to climb to the levels which many developed countries already have, mm -hmm. at least six to eight times. And I, I see nuclear as also renewables, of course, after taking into account that intermittency of the uh, power that comes from uh, renewables, nuclear is an extremely important option. The countries which already have a very high level of electricity consumption mm -hmm. per capita, per capita is the right parameter, whether you look at carbon dioxide emissions or whether you look at uh, electricity consumption, if you have to increase it substantially, even if the climate change threat were not there, there is just not enough 
fossil fuel in the world to satisfy mm -hmm. the demands of this. Renewables, hydro, extremely important. Second generation biofuels, very, very important. But as I look into the future, nuclear is an extremely important option. And as India is doing, you have to close the nuclear fuel cycle. What I call is not just throw away the spent fuel as waste, but take the valuable plutonium out of it and put it back into new kinds of reactors, like India is doing, mm -hmm. uh, fast breeder reactors. And then go to thorium. If you put thorium into these reactors, thorium gets converted to uranium-233. If you close the cycle with uranium, then you have got, that's what I always say. Nuclear is now recognized as a mitigation technology in the context of the climate change threat. But if you want it to be a sustainable mitigation technology, you have to close the nuclear fuel cycle.